Raymond, we are here in Milan in the year of science fiction 2019 <laughs> and digital biology is reshaping the world. So what are the latest things that you are most excited about that sounded science fiction and now are becoming reality? One of the, the big pieces that is really fun for me because we've read about it in science fiction for so long, but now we see it as a reality is, is cellular agriculture, this idea of growing meat outside of an animal. And we're seeing it come into being more and more, uh, not just because it's a cool science project or something people can do, but we're seeing it as a way where we've got billions of people in the world actually entering the middle class and wanting to be able to participate in all of the things that that means, like a Western-style diet and being able to have meat. And so we're, we're finally at this point where we have world hunger within our sights. It's not whether people are going to have enough food to eat in the next 10 years, in the next 30 years. It's will we all be able to enjoy the same kind of diet without stripping the environment of the planet. And so one of the tools that I think gets us there is this cellular agriculture. And that's tremendous because there are big leaps being made now. It's still in that sort of that launching point of these exponential curves, but it's really becoming real. And uh, it is not only going to be good for the environment, but uh, I actually believe that by becoming programmable, our food is going to be much more diverse and fun and we will have apps on our phones and we will just decide whether we want medieval shapes or Martian colony shapes uh, for our hamburgers. Mm -hmm. I, that's one of the things and I think so many people don't get this. They're stuck on this idea of a, an axis that is organic versus artificial. And I think we'll have that, but we'll have sort of like organic, but also gene edited or you know really good for the environment or incredibly artificial where your mood your food moves across your plate or changes with your mood and different things like that but uh, it, it'll be a, this world with a lot of choices some of them personalized to your health some of them just for the idea of doing something fun and uh, we won't be limited to one spectrum there will be two or three GMOs famously um, made a marketing mistake um, a few decades ago and Europe uh, is now in a position where it is going to be very difficult to embrace some of the emerging technologies because of uh, a branding error. The expression gene editing sounds less uh, menacing. Do you expect Europe to be able to embrace it uh, with less bias? I think so. It's kind of funny. I have a lot of maybe not necessarily popular iconoclastic opinions about this. Um, honestly, I don't think gene editing is that different from full-scale genetic engineering. And I don't think either one of them are very different from being able to, you know, breed crops over time. It's just doing it shorter, quicker, and more precisely. But uh, I think people are more comfortable with this idea where it's not some weird protein that we've pulled from another animal and stuck in a plant. So it's, it, it, it's a more comfortable feeling. At the same time, you know, and there has been this grand experiment that was the Americas, U.S. and Brazil and Argentina versus Europe where precautionary principle and what the hell, let's give it a try and see what happens. And there was no support re really for either one, but they've been on these different sides. What I think will really happen over the next 10 years very quickly is China will decide, and the populace of China, will this be something that we accept and import? And then China, Southeast Asia, it will be all about the food import there. Um, in the next 10 years, we'll see more people on the planet in Africa and if that becomes a big food importing region then that will be where the pool is but you know right now whatever China says goes for the market and then everybody will shift to non-GMO or GMO for economic reasons I believe. A little bit like solar uh, creates a completely new uh, geopolitical landscape for 
energy production, isn't it the case that cellular agriculture is going to decentralize food production to the point where we will transfer technologies and industrial scaling and practices, but food will be industrially grown wherever energy and the input materials are available. So China and Africa may not import food from elsewhere for the world, from the world. Absolutely. Um, and that's a fantastic point. We actually are looking at what is the, the green belt economy. So what are the places in the world really that have enough free energy, meaning solar power, and have enough water? And land prices are cheap because we think it will be something that covers the area. But that's going to be both the food economy and some of that's going to be based on cellular agriculture microbes. Some of it will be based on actually what looks like traditional agriculture, but the plants themselves and the microbes in the soil will be radically different and uh, it won't be rows of corn plants. It'll look like a jungle. It'll be radical polyculture that's watered very precisely with lots of data informing where resources are applied, robot harvesting. I mean, you can kind of start to see where this happens. But the next layer on top of that, that's how we make our food. That'll also be how we make all of the materials of a technical civilization. This idea of industrial biology or synthetic biology is going to either look like vats of microbes making goop uh, and, and for good that we eat or use or plants growing the materials that we need either to eat or use or a little bit of both. I think that becomes interesting. Gene sequencing is a jolting technology. Uh, something where it is not only exponential, but the rate of acceleration is actually increasing. Describe how that comes about. What are the factors that drive this uh, tremendous rate uh, uh, increase? Sure, and I love that you asked that question. And David, you and I share such a love for the way these systems of technologies work together and produce something new. Uh, gene sequencing, any kind of reading of DNA is sort of a great example of Moore's Law squared. So we've got the usual Moore's Law that is computing power increasing in you know, uh, price performance. But on top of that, just the computers that we use to analyze the sequence and be able to identify particular bases and, and do the whole thing together. We have also are looking physically at another Moore's Law where we're packing more and more DNA on a smaller and smaller platform and that saves money, that saves time, it goes faster and cheaper. And so it's sort of Moore's Law compounded. Um, what we've seen, and I know this is something you and I have just talked about recently, is we saw greater than Moore's Law increases in price performance during the first part and the middle part of the, the last 20 years, but it's sort of evened off now. And some of that I know is due to the fact that some of the large companies that control this technology have got a bit of a monopoly. But we're actually seeing uh, progress that keeps accelerating because of a network effect that's coming into play. More and more people have access to either their own or in research to a lot of people's genetic data. And the more you have, the more valuable that becomes. And there's a lot of implications from that. So we have uh, innovation in basic research. We have innovation on the level of uh, applied engineering, both hardware and software. And we have innovation in business models and how the value uh, of this uh, new data and practice can be delivered to consumers and businesses. And that's such a great insight. The, the idea, one of the, the implications of that, even though the price is only going down at a mere Moore's Law rate now, we're actually seeing free genomes being distributed because the network effect where that data is worth so much to researchers or people who want to market with it or people who are finding new business models to use the data sometimes by making it available on the blockchain and other ways 
that makes it valuable to them where they will pay the small amount of money that it still takes. And so you or I or a, a whole nation full of people might receive this data for free. Thank you very much. This was wonderful. And I'm looking forward to meet you, whether in one year uh, or in 10 years, and to see how digital biology is changing the 21st century. It's such a pleasure. Always great to talk to you. And maybe in 100 years, because we hope that's on the horizon, too. Thank you, David.